Hello, I think we're going to restart our afternoon presentations. Thank you for joining us after lunch. I am really excited to introduce the next speaker, and I'm really excited to hear what she has to tell us about the future of myeloma, because apparently it's here. Very pumped about this. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Kelly Sidor. She's our next speaker today. She is one of our outpatient nurse practitioners and instructor uh, in the Blood Disorder and Cell Therapy Center at the University of Colorado here at the Anschutz campus. Kelly received her bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of Iowa and then her master's degree in nursing from Rush University in 2011. She worked as an outpatient bone marrow transplant at Northwestern Hospital as a nurse practitioner for 10 years before moving here in 2021. She's on the committees for post-allogeneic stem cell transplant patients, survivorship, and multiple myeloma. She is also currently our co-chair of our plasma cell committee at the University of Colorado, and she enjoys implementing policies and streamlining protocols for this patient population. So she is our house expert on myeloma. No pressure, Kelly. Thank you very much, Meredith, for that warm introduction. Um, I have the wonderful task of talking right after lunch. Hopefully everyone's not about to fall asleep. But I have, I think, the most exciting topic of the day. As you can see, I've got a futuristic scape here. Um, highlighting flying saucers, or not saucers, flying cars, rather. And that is how I feel about myeloma. All these things are happening so fast, it's hard to keep up. Will this be our future with technology? Maybe. What's going to happen with myeloma? Um, so um, we'll, what I will talk about today is the future of auto stem cell transplants with quadruplet therapy. Will we still be doing them? Um, an overview of CAR-T therapy and bite therapy data, indications in the side effect profile, um, and sequencing of immunotherapy, which is becoming ever so important. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. First, I have a case study um, highlighting a patient with IgG kappa, 81-year-old female, um, which kind of fits into that frail category Alex talked about earlier. Um, initially diagnosed in 2020 with smoldering, which progressed to high risk. Um, as you can see, she had a PET CT with innumerable, innumerable lytic lesions, and she also had extramedullary disease, making her hard to treat. Um, she was induced with Darylin and Dex. She had a partial response, then she progressed. Um, then she was treated uh, with palliative radiation, um, and then she had KPD, and then she relapsed again and had ISA KPD. She then went on to um, collect cells for CAR-T um, and have apheresis and had some bridging therapy with talquetamab, which I'll talk about later. Um, and her course was notable for grade one CRS, um, which was managed uh, in back pain, which was managed with DEX. And then third, the third time it was managed with TOSI. Um, and then she was followed with silt cell CAR-T. Um, I chose this case to highlight the amazing response she had after CAR-T. Um, given that she was 81 years old, she really didn't have a lot of comorbidities, except she went into CAR-T um, on the talquetamab a little underweight. So she had a little short admission for failure to thrive. Um, they didn't end up placing a feeding tube. Um, and she also had grade one CRS that resolved with steroids. And then you can see her amazing response. She did, she had a negative PET, but her bone marrow was below the level of detection, um, but still technically MRD positive. However, our physician decided to take her off treatment completely. Now she's doing great. She gets labs every month. We follow them serially every three months and she sees the attending every six months. This is just a picture of all the different mechanisms we use to treat myeloma, which is overly complicated and you can look at your own leisure, but it kind of highlights that now we have all these different pathways where we're treating this disease. Um, and at our program, we typically um, start out with quadruplet therapy um, with, uh, as Alex talked about earlier, earlier, DARA RVD is what we prefer to use at our center. Um, but I am mostly going to talk about the newer therapies, um, CAR-T and bispecific antibodies. Um, this also highlights the auto transplant 
still known to be a very good response rate. Um, but I just wanted to show all the different therapies and all the different um, triplets and quadruplets that we have in this slide as well. Um, so monoclonal antibodies, as we know, back in 2015, have sort of changed the landscape of treatment for myeloma. Um, the Griffin trial is the main one that we use at our center to highlight that DARA um, added to the VRD combo resulted in high quality responses with um, VGPR was 72% and MRD negativity was 21% for induction compared to 56% and 5.8% respectively. Then we have the Perseus trial, um, which evaluated D DARA VRD um, and DRD, and after four cycles of DARA combined with DRD, 90% of those patients achieved VGPR with 38% 38 MRD negativity. And then the MRAS trial, um, which is more much more recent, um, came out recently, I think in the past year, said that isotuximab plus VRD um, versus VRD alone showed that um, after a median follow-up of 59.7 months, uh, median progression-free survival was not reached with isatuximab plus VRD, and there was a 54.3 months um, with VRD alone. And the five-year progression-free survival rate was 63% versus 45% respectively. And then last, I wanna talk about the benefit trial, which was isatuximab plus VRD versus isatuximab plus LEN and DEX. Um, and the estimated 24-month progression-free survival rate was 85% versus 80%, and the estimated overall survival rate was 91% in each arm. What does this tell us? Monoclonal antibodies are great as a first-line therapy, um, and it's changed the role of the auto stem cell transplant. Um, now we pretty much, unless they're very frail, start them on a four-drug regimen. We always include at our program, um, a monoclonal antibody with that four drug regimen. Um, typically, we also do steroids, uh, proteasome inhibitor, and an IMID. Um, and what role does the MRD status? I think uh, that has yet to be defined how that will play into whether we keep these people on induction therapy longer. Um, and what does that mean for their therapy? Do we take them off therapy? Um, so there's a lot to be done with MRD status. I don't think we really know what the role of that will play in the future of myeloma. And then um, we know that there's a risk uh, or there's a benefit of an auto transplant with high risk myeloma. So that um, remains to be seen, but probably will stay as a mainstay of treatment for um, high risk myeloma. But then as far as now that we have bispecifics moving to the fourth line and CAR-T moving to second line, Will that replace myelo or autos? That's yet to be seen. Um, and this is just a slide showing CAR T therapy. Um, the only ones we have available FDA approved is the BCMA target. Um, and so this is expressed on late stage B lymphocytes and plasma cells, uh, always overexpressed on myeloma cells, and it's associated with uncontrolled proliferation and immunosuppressive effect on bone marrow microenvironment it is not expressed in normal tissue or hemo hematopoietic cells. Um, there are several reasons why the practice of reserving CAR T cells for the fourth or fifth line and beyond is suboptimal. Um, patients in the very late se line setting often have aggressive refractory disease with limited bridging therapy options to maintain disease control during manufacturing, which leads to significant proportion unable to ever receive their CAR T cells. They're, they more frequently have poor prognostic free features such as high-risk cytogenetics or extramedullary disease associated with less durable remissions, as well as more limited marrow reserve, which can lead to prolonged cytopenias after CAR-T therapy. Less heavily pretreated pre patients will have, whoop, sorry. <laughs> less heavily pretreated patients will have more disease control options um, during manufacturing leading to low uh, tumor burden and less risk of CRS, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or ICANs, um, and delayed toxicities. And earlier uh, use of CAR T cells may also be associated with healthier T cells at the time of apheresis, potentially leading to fewer manufacturing failures. Um, so just real quick, I want to talk about some of the trials that led to CAR T being approved for myeloma. We have with Siltacel, or I can't even say this name, 
I'll just call it silt to cell. Um, the Cardiacid one trial where 97 heavily pretreated patients with six prior lines of therapy were treated um, with CAR-T compared to standard of care. And there was an overall response rate with 95% that had VGPR with complete remission at 83% and overall survival had still not been reached at 35 months. And the median progression-free survival was 34.9 months. Um, and then we have the IDASL trial, which was the KARMA-2, where 128 heavily pretreated patients with six prior lines of therapy and the overall response rate was 70% with 50% in VGPR and median progression-free survival of nine months um, and complete remission in a third of those patients. And then to expand upon that, we had the KARMA-3 trial with IDASL versus the standard of care with two, prior, two to four prior lines of therapy. Um, those patients were triple class refractory, 66% of them were DARA refractory and had most of them were in high risk cytogenetics, 44% of them, and it was randomized two to one to either IDASL or standard of care regimen, which are all listed here. And then the primary endpoint was reached, median progression free survival was 13.8 months versus standard of care, which was 4.4. This led to the approval um, after two prior lines of therapy, including a PI, EMID, and CD38 monoclonal antibody. And then silta cell. Um, for the standard of care with one to three prior lines, we have the PI and EMIT exposed, the LEN refractory patients, um, and the high-risk cytogenetics, 59% of those had that, and there was a choice of standard of care um, listed here, PVD or DPD, and the median progression-free survival was not reached versus 11.8 months for the standard of care, and this led to silta cell um, after one prior line of therapy, including a PI and an EMID and those that are LEN refractory. So the two main things I want to talk about today um, are probably the two biggest side effects we see with CAR-T at our center. Um, we have cytokine release syndrome and immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity syndrome, ICANS. Um, so what is CRS? CRS stands for cytokine release syndrome. It's an uncontrolled systemic inflammatory effect characterized by high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. It's induced by T cell activ activation. So you have the IL-6, the IL-10, and the interferon Y. Those are the most common core cytokines that we are consistently found to be elevated. Um, it leads to a higher, a higher incidence of CRS has been associated with higher tumor burden and drug dosages. So um, clinical manifestations can vary. There's a bunch of them listed on here um, from fever to rash to severe multi organ system failure. Um, other common signs and symptoms can include nausea, headache, rash, tachycardia, hypotension, dyspnea. Um, and then although most T-cell engaging therapy patients experience at least some degree of CRS, there seems to be no direct association between the severity of CRS and the clinical response. So CRS does not seem to indicate that there is a level of response to T-cell engaging therapies. Um, some patients show complete remission with no real obvious signs of CRS, and some people have um, severe CRS and still don't have um, a good re response. And then ICANS stands for immune effect, immune um, effector, sorry, bear with me one second. ICANS stands for... Um, our immune effector cell associated neurotox syndrome. Um, this is not as well understood, the underlying mechanism, but, but it's thought to be that along with this release of inflammatory cytokines, there's also increased vascular perme permeability and endothelial activation, all leading to the blood brain barrier breakdown. Um, it's uh, those with this, again, if you have a higher disease burden, um, you typically are at higher risk for this as well. Symptoms can be vague. Um, some people can present with like some mild confusion. Some people can prevent, present with unusual handwriting. Um, but the reason this is so important because if it becomes severe, it can lead to cerebral edema um, and seizures. Um, this just shows there are our grades from the studies of karma three and carditude four of CRS of any grade, 
Um, as you can see, most of it, it there's very little of grade three or four and very little um, on the SILTA cell as well. Um, and the neurotox as well, it's mostly low grade. There are There is some evidence of um, CN palsies in SILTA cell, and there's one patient um, that had developed some Parkinsonian syndrome, which I'll talk about later, that's been reported. Um, and then CRS grading at our institution, we use this scale. Um, just want to highlight that we always go by, if it's not attributable to any other cause, um, and they have the highest grade would be, so grade three, if they don't have a fever and they, um, and they have a normal blood pressure, or, or I'm sorry, they don't need oxygen, but they still need pressors, they would be grade three. Um, and then for our management here, um, typically we admit them if they have grade one CRS, most institutions would um, monitor more frequently. Um, also, we do supportive care, hydration, steroids. Um, if they're grade two or higher, anti-cytokines we do here. Uh, the main one that's FDA approved is tocilizumab. Um, other ones that there's ongoing studies are anakinra and siltuximab. Um, and then because fever, you can't rule out that there isn't an infection, we usually do antibiotics. And then typically we don't discharge them from the hospital unless they've been afebrile for at least 24 to 40 hour, 48 hours and they have a downtrending CRP, which we use as an inflammatory marker and ferritin. Um, this is also our score we use um, to evaluate neurotoxicity. It's the ICE tool. Um, we do a lot of outpatient bite therapy. I work outpatient only. Outpatient bite therapy, outpatient uh, CAR-T. We ask this every single time we see them. Um, for CAR T, I think we do it up to day 30. Uh, it's very based, all, all our nurses are very well versed in this as well. Um, so it's pretty basic, but it's easy to find out if they're confused. And then we grade with this grading scale. And obviously, if they develop grade one, we would be readmitting them to the hospital if there's any signs of confusion. Um, and then because ICANs are worried about that breakdown of the blood brain barrier. It's a little more intensive a workup than CRS. So we will do all the supportive care I already talked about for CRS, but we, and steroids and anacytokines, but we also always do a neuro consult, um, give them anti-seizure prof prophylaxis, and we wanna rule out other causes. Um, so we always wanna do some sort of brain imaging, and we wanna do a lumbar puncture to check for um, disease or infection and an EEG. Um, now, movement and neurocognitive toxicities with SILTA cell. This was reported initially at a little higher um, of an amount, which is thought to be because it was used as a later line of therapy. So there was a higher risk of CRS and neurotox. Now, with more studies, it's now reported less than 1% with SILTA cell. Um, and it's thought to be related to the target in the BCMA and the basal ganglia that you present with these Parkinsonian syndromes. Um, so you can present with a cluster of movement, cognitive and personality changes. Uh, symptoms can be very variable, but the most common present presentation is micrographia, um, which is where you have smaller cramped handwriting. Um, and there's a wide range of onset. Um, there are some reports of this happening further out than day 30. So we're currently under trying to decide what we should do with that information, if we should do a risk stratification for how high their tumor burden was going into CAR-T to determine if we should continue checking their handwriting in the community um, and what we do with that info, but there's really no general consensus on, consensus on what to do with that. Um, and the current uh, reported um, ways that have, the reported therapies that have been beneficial is, is steroids and IV cyclophosphamide have been reported to be beneficial in this situation. Um, other toxicities of CAR-T, we have cytopenias, um, mainly the first few months out of transplant. So we do a lot of aggressive growth factors, um, transfusions. We check for viruses also, because you want to rule out that they make sure they don't have some sort of virus causing them to have cytopenias. And sometimes they need a stem cell boost. Uh, there's also, because they have all these cytopenias, higher risk of infection. Um, I was surprised that it wasn't that different from the standard of care though. <laughs> um, and then 
prophylaxis against zoster and PJP. Uh, we also, if they're neutropenic, we'll put them on a fluoroquinolone and antifungal, um, which is not on the slide. And then IVIG, uh, we typically check around day 30 at our program and then give them uh, IVIG, or we check an IgG if they're under 400, we give them IVIG. Um, also want to make sure they vac they're vaccinated going into CAR-T. However, we don't typically revaccinate until three months post CAR-T. Um, and then also there's the, this rare T-cell lymphoma that's reported in MDS and AML. However, you have to remember most of these people have had lenalidomide um, for induction therapy, which has a warning for risk of secondary malignancies. Um, and so in conclusion, BCMA is superior to standard of care in early relapsed myeloma. It can be given as a second or third line of therapy. Um, CRS and ICANs are predictable and predominantly low grade, especially uh, when it's used early in the treatment of the disease. Uh, cytopenias, neurotox, and infections are common, uh, and aggressive PPX is very important. And CAR T cells appear promising as a consolidation of frontline therapy. There's ongoing challenges, which I'll talk about in a minute, predictors of response and resistance, and sequencing of immunotherapy is um, becoming a new area that we need to study more. Um, and there's also access and cost barriers for CAR-T. Next, I wanna talk about bispecific antibodies. What is a bispecific antibody? It simultaneously binds to specific target antigen on a tumor cell and a T cell, and it helps facilitate immune cell mediated cancer cell death. It can provide a higher binding specificity compared to monoclonal antibodies uh, since they interact with two different surface cell antigens. And um, it can also help avoid drug resistance by targeting two different growth promoters on the surface of a tumor cell. These are all the different mechanisms of action, tumor cell targeting, immunomodulation, direct cytotoxicity, redirected T cell killing, immune cell recruitment, and then inhibition angiogenesis, which is basically cutting off the blood supply to that tumor. What are the different ones we have for myeloma? Well, now we have three FDA approved by specifics, which is very exciting. Um, this, these have all been approved for use as a um, relapsed refractory patient who's received at least four previous lines of therapy, including a proteasome inhibitor, an IMID, um, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. We've got talquetamab, teclistamab, and the last one I have a hard time saying, elranitamab. Hopefully I can keep saying that the correct way. <laughs> and then, so first we have teclistamab. This was approved in 2022 with the Majestic 1 trial that showed an overall response rate of 63%, um, with 39% achieving complete remission or better. There's ongoing trials with this drug, combining it with other therapies. And then um, these are the adverse events. I haven't really seen a lot of hepatotoxicity, I have to say, but it, it's been reported. Neutropenia, definitely. Um, there's definitely probably more of an infection risk with this one that we've seen clinically. Um, CRS is 72%. And I also want to mention, we have this step-up dosing. So these patients are always admitted to the hospital for the step-up dosing because there's a high risk of CRS at the beginning of treatment, but there's also a risk of recurrent CRS at 33%, but it's typically during the step-up dosing. And then we have Elranitumab, which was approved in 2023. This targets BCMA as well. Um, and this was approved with the Magnetism 3 study that showed an overall response rate of 61% uh, with 35% in complete remission. The adverse events are similar to the other ones. I do want to note um, the CRS is a little bit less reported at 58% with this drug. And this also has a hospitalization that's recommended for initial and step-up dosing. Um, and one other thing I wanted to highlight, which I didn't with the other drug, is they need pre-medications because there's a hypersensitivity reaction sometimes with these drugs. Um, and then talquetamab. Uh, that also was approved in 2023, but that targets a different um, antigen. That is the GPRC5D. Um, and that is, I'll talk about in a minute, um, leads to some a different side effect profile. But that was approved with the monumental trial uh, that showed that weekly dosing had an overall response rate of 74% with 59% 
vGPR and a median progression free survival of 7.5 months. So it does have this unique um, side effect profile with taste changes, dry mouth, dry skin, rashes, nail changes, discoloration. And this happens because this GPRC5D is expressed on keratinized tissues of the skin and tongue. Um, and this also, there's a weekly and a bi-weekly dosing that you can use for this drug. People are admitted to the hospital um, for the step up portion, but we see a lot of these, excuse me, a lot of these people outpatient. And this is typically what you see. Um, some ridge, some nail ridge discoloration. Um, mostly uh, they get a little oral, like metallic taste in their mouth. They don't want to eat a lot of food. So we always recommend a dietitian consult for these patients. Um, the biggest side effect is weight loss. So you want to consider that, don't want to consider this for your frail elderly patients that are already underweight typically. Um, but it does have an on target off tumor side effect to 70%. So you will see this with this drug. Um, and how do we treat this? Um, as I said before, a dietitian consult, you want to be really honest before you start. Um, topical creams, emollients, steroids, mouthwashes, uh, nail hardeners, um, and sometimes lemon drops and biotin to help improve the salivary gland production because they just have a dry mouth all the time. Um, but we do see that with modified dosing, uh, most of these related adverse effects um, tend to get a little better with time, um, except for the weight loss. And then this just overall compares all the biospecifics I just talked about. Uh, just wanted to highlight that um, this is the CRS occurrence, as you can see, uh, the L-ranitumab is a little bit lower. Um, and there is a reoccurrence. And then this is the side effect profile. And as you can see, talquetamab, since it has a different antigen, has a little bit of, of a different side effect profile than the other two. And this is just another slide showing the recurrent CRS. As you can see, one third of patients in these first two, the first two T's, I'll call them, um, it's 30, a third of your patients, but l is only 13%. Um, same with neurotox, there is a small risk of recurrence. Um, and typically what we see clinically in the outpatient setting is a headache, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that they get admitted and we do brain imaging. But that's, I'd say, the most common presentation that we've seen. Um, and I have clinically not seen any of significant neurotox in the outpatient setting. Um, and then choosing overall between bispecific antibodies, you want to um, take into consideration what you're targeting. Are you targeting um, BCMA or GPRC5? And you want to also consider the dosing. Uh, Teclistimab and Telquetimab use weight-based dosing, which in l is fixed dosing. So there is a potential for overtreating with that drug. And then the future of bispecific antibodies, it's hard to know what the future is really, but there's all these ongoing trials with combos with other drugs that we use normally in myeloma, which is very exciting. Um, and now there's talk about these tri-specific antibodies, which is basically a single antibody engineered to recognize three different targets that shows a lot of promise and is ongoing cl clinical trials. Um, and this improves the ability of T cells to target cancer. So in summary, uh, by specific versus CAR-T, bispecific, why do we use it more in the community? It's off the shelf, readily available. Um, it does not require lymphodepletion. Uh, there's no risk of manufacturing failure. You can get it right away. Well, usually right away if you need it um, for someone actively relapsing. Uh, there is a high risk of infection, and this is thought to be due to the potential activation of regulatory T cells. It does require multiple doses. So some patients would prefer to get CAR-T because it's a one and done situation, even though they need to see us for 30 days, but then after that, hopefully they can go off treatment. Uh, but there is a lower incidence of CRS and ICANS. And then with CAR-T, um, currently the only one we have available that's FDA approved are autologous. So the patient's gonna apherese their own cells. Um, with that being said, there is a risk of manufacturing failure. So if you've got someone late in therapy and they're using this as a fifth line and this is all they have, it's not the best option because what if there is failure with 
that then they have to collect again. Uh, it does require lymphodepletion, depletion and there is a higher incidence of CRS and ICANs with CAR-T. Um, like I said before, one thing that is really nice, it's one and done. Um, even though at our center, they have to live within 30 miles, I think for the first 30 days, um, which can be kind of taxing and have a primary caregiver. So you need to take that into consideration. Um, but it does overall have a longer progression-free survival and a higher response rate um, in general than by specifics. Um, and then the next thing I want, the last thing I really want to talk about is sequencing of immunotherapy and why it's important. Well, this is becoming a new hot topic at ASCO, um, basically because most of our patients we're seeing in myeloma are getting either bispecific or a CAR-T. And there's been a recent approval of anti-BCMA CAR-Ts in first and second relapse. We know this already. Uh, and there's two different targets with bispecifics, anti-BCMA and anti-GPRC5. Um, we know that there are relapses after bispecific and CAR-T, and understanding how to sequence this is very important. Uh, and it's likely that most patients will be treated with both these agents at some point in their disease course. So CAR-T, we know the progression-free survival I mentioned already is usually one to two years, and they typically go off treatment. Um, relapse off treatment is usually when the BCMA is still expressed. So usually we don't reinfuse with the same products because it won't immediately, it does not work. Uh, so we usually, if we do reinfuse with an anti-BCMA, it's a different drug than the one we already used. Uh, timing of CAR-T salvage is important from prior BCMA therapy. Um, the longer duration, the better. And we do see a lot of cytopenias post CAR-T. So we always wanna consider stem cell boost as an option also after CAR-T. And there's thought to be less T cell exhaustion with CAR T. So typically it's thought that bispecific salvage works well as a salvage. Um, and then following bispecifics, we know the median progression free survival is around 12 months. Um, there's they're constantly on treatment. So there's this constant selection pressure with the drug. So there's more antigen loss and mutation. Um, the nice thing is there's different targets. So there's two options, switching um, one to the other, the BCMA or the GPRC5, um, if a different one's being expressed, but the regulatory T cells can induce resistance. So there's a possible need for combo therapy in the future. And this actually is just like another slide showing that overall um, our center, it's, it's kind of a widely um, thought theoretical concern that by specifics before CAR T, uh, exhaust the patient's T cells and lead to suboptimal CAR T products. Now, overall optimism, this is mainly optimism in everything with myeloma, but it's a very exciting time. Um, I just wanted to once again remind you that failure of one bispecific or CAR T does not necessarily mean failure of another. And CAR T prior to bispecifics is generally thought as more successful. You always wanna check your antigen expression, the BCMA or GPRC5 before you give it one of these drugs. Um, and there's more antigens lo lost with bispecifics. So you wanna take that into consideration. So timing and T cell fitness are very important before you get um, these drugs and considering that with your therapy. Stem cell boost um, also is a good bridge to the next T cell engaging therapy. Um, and then hopefully combo therapies will continue to improve our outcomes in the future. This is another study just showing um, that after CAR-T therapy uh, with T-cell and directed therapy still had better outcomes than standard of care. So people that relapsed after CAR-T um, done on 140 patients that relapsed, 79 went on to get salvage therapy and the median over, overall survival was 17.9 months. Salvage therapy with bispecifics or CAR-T had the best outcomes. Um, the overall survival was still not reached at the two-year follow-up. Standard of care did not do well with median progression-free survival of 3.5 months. Um, and then these are some ongoing phase three global trials. Very exciting with CARTITUDE 5 uh, for those that are transplant ineligible. It's with VRD induction for two cycles and then either LEN or de DEX maintenance or VRD bridging and then siltacel and then no maintenance. And then the CARTITUDE 6 for transplant eligible, which is DARA VRD induction and then either auto versus siltacel with lenalide, lenalidide maintenance um, for a total of two years. So that's very exciting that we're 
thinking of doing this even sooner. Um, and then this is also, I was shocked to see how many, I mean, I guess it's not that shocking anymore, but how many different CAR-T products are out on the pipeline um, and targeting all these different antigens. It's a very exciting time to figure out, you know, it's almost overwhelming how much we have available to us. Um, and it's a very exciting time for myeloma. Um, and so that's why I wanted to highlight the Jetsons because this will date me as well, just like Caroline. I grew up watching this in the 80s and things we never thought possible, right? Home office, online classes, telemedicine. This was something in the 80s that was never thought possible. Now with myeloma, MRD negativity, what? That was never a thing we thought could even be possible. Remaining off drugs. Um, it's a very exciting thing to be even thinking about this. Um, what's our role in the auto transplant in the future? with an auto transplant in the future. This is yet to be decided now with CAR-T moving to second line. Um, and bispecifics are possibly gonna move to earlier line. We also have uh, a clinical trial here. We have, I think only one patient that had allo CAR-T, uh, which uses this immune cloaking technology that turns off um, genetics, which is in the cells created from stem cells to avoid detection by the immune system. We have a patient right now that just had this done. This is very exciting um, and also gives you quicker access to CAR-T for those patients that I mentioned earlier that have failed um, their collection for whatever reason or their T cells are exhausted. So that's very exciting. And then the, I mentioned earlier the tri-specific antibodies, which are also um, being studied in the future. So it's a very exciting time and the future is here and I'm very happy to give this talk Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kelly. I'll open it up for any questions. Thanks, Kelly. That was awesome. Um, I'm really curious about the bites and the side effects with the yes. nails and taste yes. piece. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Because I, I feel like we are not as aware of that on the inpatient side, at least. I mean, not that we're not aware, but it's almost like an afterthought. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any pro tips for us on the inpatient side of how we should be managing that better. And, you know, at what point we would sort of, um, I don't I don't even know, like think about notifying a physician and or like I think, consider therapy changes. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is weight loss, right? If they are already underweight and they continue to lose weight, you might want to consider a different therapy because obviously, like I mentioned before, that's not really one that's found to be reversible, reversible. Um, but I would say outpatient, we always have a dietitian consult on hand. Um just pushing small, frequent meals, oral hydration. Those are the things we press outpatient and the rashes that they present with initially, um, those typically resolve after I'd, I don't know exactly how long I don't have the data on that, but I would say like most of the time, if you just keep them on topical steroids, that'll go away with time. 